thing. Right. So um, I'll do some quick introductions on, on our end. I'm Nicole Madour. I'm the Early Childhood Specialist at the Department of Education. I work on the Early Learning Team. Um, a large part of my work is to help public pre-K programs with the implementation of their programs. Um, with that comes, of course, conversations around instructional programs, assessment, you name it. Um, so today we wanted to make sure that we provided an opportunity for schools to learn more about the pre-K for me instructional program. So that will be um, our the bulk of our conversation. I do have a slideshow um, to help walk me through that. But I also have two of my colleagues here. So I didn't know Sue and Leanne, if you guys wanted to introduce yourselves real quick. Leanne, I'll have you. Yep, perfect. <laughs> sure, sure thing, Nicole. Hey, everybody. It's really nice to see you this afternoon. I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the director of the early learning team in the Department of Education. And I'm um, really excited that you are interested in learning more about pre K for me. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Sue Galant. I'm the pre K expansion consultant working on the early learning team at the Department of Ed. And I provide te technical assistance to districts that are part of the MJRP grant. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint here, and this will just help me keep on track. And at any point, please feel free to unmute or use the chat box with any questions or clarifications. I'm happy to, to pause and have any side conversations that are necessary. Um, and Sue and Leanne, as you well know, if you guys I'm speaking out of on anything, feel free to jump in with us. Any additional thoughts that you have? along the way. So Pre-K for Me is our state's instructional uh, program for public pre-K. Um, as we sort of go through the slides, you'll see how this came to be and why, uh, what it entails, um, how far we've come, and what our goals are moving forward. Um, so some of the big pieces we'll start off with is really just the history of our work with Pre-K for Me, um, the individual components that really make this program what it is. Um, it's not uncommon for other for folks to hear about the Pre-K for Me components and relate it to another common curriculum. So we'll talk about that as well, and you'll see where there's some similarities and commonalities there. And then certainly want to offer any time for questions. But like I said, as I move along, don't um, hesitate to, to interrupt and pause and ask anything that you comes to mind. Okay, so the development of Pre-K for Me, the instructional program, uh, really we could go all the way back to 2005. Um, this is when Boston Public Schools, which is their Department of Early Education, created their Pre-K classrooms across the city. And during that time, they adopted OWL, which is uh, Opening the World of Learning. Um, it is largely a literacy-based curriculum. And they also adopted Building Blocks for Math. And over the course of the next nine years, those programs were reevaluated and a team was put together to expand the OWL program to incorporate all areas of learning. So as that work was happening here in Maine, we found that public pre-K teachers uh, it was a requirement in chapter 124 that they implement an evidence based curriculum that was aligned and met our early learning and development standards. Um, we were wanting and hearing that pre K teachers wanted to move back into a play based schedule for their students. Um, and they were wanting to prepare their children, of course, for that successful transition to kindergarten. And as is the case now. Pre-K is really widely diverse in what children have access to, meaning some programs are offering full day, maybe full week programming. Some um, schools still offer half day or what we call part day programming. So there's a, a big uh, variation um, across the state. And so our TA and our communication with schools was really varied in what would be best for their community. Um, and we were hearing a lot that some of the evidence-based curricula that is purchased uh, wasn't necessarily what was best for individual communities. Uh, we did receive a grant from the US Department of Education and those funds were used to adapt 
Boston Public Schools curriculum for Maine. So you'll recall back around 2014 when Boston Public Schools got together to uh, work on the OWL program and they created for themselves what's called um, Focus on Early Learning. And that's what we worked with Boston to adapt for Maine. Um, in the focus on early learning, some of the lessons and books and um, units were focused around city life um, because their students obviously and their families access Boston city and the Boston communities within there. In Maine, our students and families have a much more diverse experience. Certainly we have families living in cities and we have families and students that are in much more rural parts of our state. So we wanted to make sure that the pieces that we adapted to fit Maine incorporated uh, those different experiences. So fast forward to 2018, we launched a pilot of the Pre-K for Me instructional program. Um, and then in 2019, Pre-K for Me was posted on our DOE Early Learning Teams website as an open education resource, meaning anybody can access it. It's not just for public school pre-K programs. Child cares can also access it as freely as they want to. Um, it's there, it's, it's available, it's, everything is linked um, to resources and additional lesson plans. So it's um, completely accessible. 2019 to 2020 during that school year is when we piloted the K for Me instructional program. Uh, at that time, we had 14 classrooms. So our goal in this work with Boston and, and also what Boston did was started at the pre-K level with a program that was um, aligned to our mouth, evidence-based, incorporated play, and then built on that for kindergarten. And then we took what we, was built in kindergarten and built on that for first grade. And then the goal is to continue. So right now, uh, k for me pilot began in 1920. That was the year that the pandemic hit. So we continued the pilot um, for the next school year, 2021 and we doubled the number of classrooms that that was piloted in. And then in August, K for Me is now posted alongside Pre-K for Me as an open education resource. So in many of our schools, not all, but, but many of our schools that are using Pre-K for Me have also adopted K for Me, um, which is really the, the goal of the work, right, is to have that, um, that transitional piece for students moving from grade to grade, uh, but it's not required. Certainly there are um, public pre-k programs throughout Maine that utilize pre-k for me but then when students transition into kindergarten that grade has adopted something else um, and then just this past school year we are currently piloting our first grade for me this says focus on first which is what Boston's is, program is called um, but in Maine we're calling it first grade for me so that is currently happening all right, so let's just focus on pre-K for me and the why. First and foremost, pre-K for me is interdisciplinary and it's aligned to MELDS. So students are really engaged in their learning across all content areas at pretty much almost any given time throughout the day. They're not just focused on math activities or just focused on literacy activities. The components are meant to address standards and learning within and across all of those interdisciplinary areas. And like I said, it's aligned to MELD, which is um, a huge uh, requirement and expectation for, for us here in Maine. Uh, Pre-K for me is also focused and offers se sequential skills and concepts. So lessons and units roll out over time in a very intentional way. Um, skills that are introduced and built on in September when students first arrive, continue and to grow and elaborate throughout the course of the school year. Pre-K for me offers explicit and intentional instruction. Um, there is pretty much no time during the, the uh, Pre-K for me day where the teachers and adults in the room are not with and interacting with the students. Um, instruction and conversations are very intentional. The lesson plans do offer examples of what adults and teachers could say to students, but certainly um, 
there's room for those conversations to be had uh, really organically within any given part of the day as well. So I know some teachers really love to have specific examples, say this, not that, um, whereas other teachers are far more comfortable in just letting conversations and instructions happen. Um, so there's really room for both of those scenarios. And pre-K for me is also framed by proven effective teaching practices, including, as I mentioned, purposeful play and project-based experiences. So when we say purposeful play, what we mean is students are engaging in activities for part of the day that they choose for themselves. Um, and it's not timed and rotated. They're not moving from station to station in a routine sort of organized way, but rather activities and materials are offered to them that are specific and intentional to the learning happening during that part of the year. And students are making choices based on their interests. Um, so whether or not they go to the art easel or the building block area, um, they're both in both areas, they're focusing on very similar content and the conversation and, and interactions that are happening during that purposeful play time um, are there for a reason. Um, it's not indoor recess, so to speak. It's not um, you have some time to go make your choice and have fun. There's time for that, but the, the bulk of pre-K for me is really purposeful um, and based on project-based experiences, which I'll get into in just a moment as well. Um, so similarly to what I was just mentioning a moment ago, students have a uh, voice and agency, meaning they can make choices for themselves and what activities and lessons um, they're partaking in. So some of the guiding principles of pre-K for me, th these four bullets are really um, what our teachers that utilize this program are really working towards and supporting in their classrooms every day. So we're wanting to make sure that young children, and we understand that young children are capable of complex, higher order thinking. That children are active participants in their learning. That they're making meaningful knowledge and it's constructed through robust interactions and high engagement. Throughout the rest of these slides, and if you were to come to um, our two-day training that we offer in the summer, that word interactions um, is huge. You'll hear it again and again and again. And also the last bullet is that instruction is impactful when teachers are researchers for their classrooms. So those guiding principles is what has um, driven us and continued this program moving forward each year. So like any curriculum, um, Pre-K for Me offers really specific and focused components um, throughout the day. So the first and most important one arguably is the read aloud or the story reading. From there, teachers move into intro to centers, which is its own component. Centers itself is another component. We also have songs, wordplay, letters, and numbers, which we call Swiplin. In the OWL program, which if you're familiar with OWL, you're probably beginning to see some similarities here as far as the components go. In that program, they have songs, wordplay, and letters, and they call it Swipple. For Maine, we wrote the math curriculum into Pre-K for Me. So uh, it math shows up in a variety of places, but one of those places is during this time of the day, which was Swipple and is now Swiplin. So you'll recall Boston adopted building blocks for their math program, um, and we really wanted schools in Maine to have access to high quality math instruction built into pre-K for me. Um, so as when we were working with Boston, we also contracted with some main educators, um, both in higher ed and at the pre-K space, um, who had a high quality early childhood math background, and they actually wrote the math component for pre-K for me. We also have Let's Find Out About It, as I mentioned, math, thinking and feedback, storytelling and story acting, and, oops, sorry, and small groups. So small groups and centers, you'll see in a moment, 
are not the same. They're very different. Um, and that, again, as is everything else, is very intentional. So pre-K for me, um, over the course of the school year, from September through June, does offer six different units of study. Uh, we always recommend, and we'll talk to teachers about this a lot, that the first two to three weeks uh, are just for routine building and environment planning. So those first few weeks as students are transitioning in, we're really just wanting educators and the adults in the space to get to know the students and vice versa. Uh, we don't encourage teachers to start unit one until about that fourth week mark, third, third or fourth week mark. But when they do, you'll find that the first unit is focused around family, and the guiding question for this unit is that a family is a group of people who care for and support one another. And we know that as young children, some of them are still three years old in September, three and four year olds coming into a new setting, such as a public pre-K classroom. Um, the one thing that they all have in common is they have some type of family, some type of group of people who care for them and support them. So we're really wanting to build on what the students know at that time and what they can really relate to and share experiences around. From there, we move into friends for similar reasons. Um, once unit two begins, they're starting to make relationships in the classroom. Um, and certainly they may or may not have a group of friends outside of the school that they um, are familiar with as well. So during the unit two friends unit of study, we focus on the question or the statement that friends may have conflicts that can cause complex feelings and friends can work together to solve problems. So I think that's a really intentional time of year to start talking about and building on these skills for young children. And like I said, this work doesn't just end at the end of unit two, right? These um, concepts are built upon throughout the rest of the units as well. And we move into unit three, wind and water, where the properties of water and wind and how weather affects humans and animals is discussed and researched. Unit four is where most programs are right around now, this time of the school year. So they're talking about the world of color. They're exploring colors in their world and seeing how colors can help them organize our world. Unit five is shadows and reflections. They're starting to explore the properties and aesthetics of light and how light affects people and animals. And the last unit at the end of the school year is things that grow which is also really timely and exciting. Um, as we know, that's typically springtime, beginning of summer, um, and things are growing all around us. So we talk about life cycles and learn how plants and animals develop over time. So you might have noticed, oops. Oh, I'm not gonna say that yet. Okay, I'll just. So as we look at the components, you'll recall that I mentioned the read aloud. Uh, this one is about a 10 to 20 minute chunk of time, depending on time of year, depending on the lesson. It is a whole group activity. Um, it's guided by the idea that what we read and how we read to children intentionally supports their early literacy skills. The two main goals of Read Aloud is vocabulary development and story comprehension. Uh, throughout all six units, there's th what we call core texts, um, and there's 30 of them. So what we mean by core texts is that those have been carefully chosen for their complex plots, uh, for their interesting characters, and for their challenging vocabulary. Some of them are going to be books that you've known and loved and shared with young children for as long as you can remember, and some of them will be new. Um, but that's okay. They're, like I said, it, as is everything, it's really there for a reason. Um, it was not just a book that we thought had a good cover and let's just throw it in there. These core texts really set the stage for the children's learning and conversations throughout the rest of the day and throughout the rest of the unit of study. So here's some quick examples of some of the texts. Um, Ezra Jack Keats is a recurring author in Pre-K for Me. We have a few of his books throughout the unit. The Little Red Hen Makes a Pizza is, you know, a stark difference from Peter's Chair, but still offers that complex plot, still offers interesting characters, um, and still might offer some challenging vocabulary. 
So the read aloud is one of the components um, that throughout the training and throughout TA, we say is a non-negotiable, right? Things happen during the day, um, uh, not recitals, um, assemblies, uh, volunteers coming in and out of the classroom, you know, half days, snow days. Um, but whenever you're in, uh, in the classroom with students, a read aloud is happening. From there, we move into intro to centers. This is uh, really brief. It typically occurs right after read aloud, but lots, we can have conversations around that, and we do during training. But intro to centers is a five to 10 minute time frame. It's still whole group. Um, and really what is happening during this time is the teacher is setting the stage for successful engagement in centers. So um, it typically occurs right before centers. Um, and this, and we can get into really what this looks like, but the teacher is modeling how to use materials, modeling um, scenarios that might present themselves in a center, um, modeling um, how to interact with a peer in a center, things like that. So it's brief, um, but very, very successful. And then from there, children move into really the bulk component of their day. So this centers is about 60 minutes um, in full day programs, and it's about 40 to 45 minutes in half day programs. So your schedule and, and how that plays out is really individual. Um, we have folks on our team that are more than willing to work with you to sort of decipher what's going to be best as far as flow and time frames. Um, so when I say that components are a certain amount of time, um, it's really just what we think is ideal in a full day perhaps, but certainly something that we can have conversations around. But point being, centers is a large chunk of time. And during this time, children are choosing freely what center that they want to learn and play in. Um, these lighter bullets are typically the centers that are available every day. Blocks, library and listening, drama, writing, the art studio and easel, which are the, um, not the same. They're typically located in the same spot, but are two different areas. The discovery table and then puzzles and manipulatives. So it's not that one is open and one is closed. They're all open and students are moving freely in and out of them, which might give some people some heartburn, but trust me, uh, with, uh, with time and patience and practice, um, it's really a, a wonderful time of day. And during this time, teachers are really actively facilitating the learning that's happening. Um, they're rotating around the room. Um, they're observing, asking questions, supporting children's learning, using rich vocabulary, and reinforcing concepts. Another big component, which typically happens right after centers, is thinking and feedback. Um, this is one that takes time takes modeling, takes practice, but is really important um, in a whole group discussion to really talk about what students um, are doing in their centers. Uh, what are they proud of? What do they have questions about? What are they trying to do that maybe did or didn't work? Their peers are looking at the work, they're noticing and sharing details, they're listening to peers talk about the work, they're wondering and making, asking questions and making suggestions. Another component, small groups, you know, remember I said this is not like centers, this is different. These are typically um, three small groups, one, and they're happening simultaneously. One is focused on literacy concepts, one has a focus on math concepts, and the third small group is typically an independent activity, something that students can do without direct supervision from an adult, puzzles, Play-Doh, um, maybe some small book browsing or some small um, manipulatives, uh, patterning, things like that. This is separate from centers. It's a whole nother time of the day. It offers students hands-on learning experiences. Groups can be, you know, divvied up however the teacher decides. Um, but once you make the group, they stick together until they've completed each of the groups. Lots to learn about small groups. I won't get into too much detail, um, but training in TA really delves in deeply around this part, this component. Um, but regardless, the group makeup should be reviewed at the end of every unit. Uh, I will add to that 
uh, in pre-K, typically there's two adults if you have a full enrollment of 16 students. And one adult will be with, for example, the literacy group. The other adult will be with a math group. And then you recall the independent group is really doing things on their own. Swiplin is another quick whole group activity. Um, this is where we're building on print and phonological awareness. We're doing this through word games, through songs, poems, and predictable texts that are also um, provided, that the titles of the predictable texts are provided in our material list. Uh, students are working on letter names and sounds, matching upper and lowercase letters, beginning and ending letter sounds, rhyming. This also, this time of day also includes math songs and counting games. Um, and then students begin to read predictable books. Let's find out about it is arguably my favorite component in pre-K for me. Um, it's certainly my favorite one to observe uh, in classrooms. It, it's really hands-on in a whole group way. It's pulling information, specifically science components from the core texts and building on those, uh, on students' conceptual knowledge of those. So you're providing information through nonfiction texts and you're doing a lot of demonstration. Students are making hypotheses and testing those out. Um, it's really a really fun um, component of, of this program, I think. And then the math component, excuse me, component is also another whole group. It's designed um, to present early math concepts in, again, an engaging and developmentally appropriate and sequential manner. Uh, it's integrated into all the units um, as it matches and aligns with each unit's goals and objectives. There's one math large group activity per week. And then those math concepts and conversations are happening throughout the other components of the day. Um, there's also two to three math small group activities per week. Storytelling and story acting is another component that takes time, takes practice, um, but when it is um, done in a regular way, it's really engaging and really rewarding for the students. Um, so this is a time of the day when one student is interacting with one adult and just telling that adult a story. Um, it could be a fictional story, it could be a non-fictional story, um, but the teacher is just listening and writing down what the student's saying and then with the student's permission we'll share that with the class and sometimes we encourage uh, the class to act out the story. So it's really about teachers listening to the children tell a story and the children listening to their classmates and the children listening to the adults. So all in the service of understanding one another's ideas and enjoying one another's stories. It's a component that can wait a bit um, until teachers have other components in place. Um, but like I said, it's, it's really fun and really engaging for the students to, to interact with. So it's not uncommon for administrators, especially to say, okay, I like what I'm hearing. These are the types of things that we're hearing our teachers and our, our families want our students to be engaging with. Um, I see a lot of literacy. I see a lot of math. I see a lot of interacting. Where's the science? Um, so these are just some pictures from, and, and I'll dive into more details, but these pictures here are um, sharing some of our science activities in our pre-K classrooms. So you can see that this student down here, I'm willing to bet this is unit six, things that grow. And he's checking out um, some seedlings. In the world of color, we talk about color fading, color fasting, and some experiments that happen with sunlight. Um, in, let's see, there's also a out side nature component. So you'll often see a lot of students and photos from classrooms of students outdoors um, engaging in uh, natural outdoor nature activities. Um, in wind and water, the here, at the top here is a photo of two children experimenting with wind through a straw. Four out of our six units are based in science. So you'll remember we start with friends and move into, or excuse me, start with family and move into friends. And then the next four units um, have a very strong science focus. 
all of these are meant to build inquiry skills um, and scientific method from the start. Um, the, the timing, I will say too, the timing of wind and water in Maine um, is typically right around the holidays and into January and February. Um, and it's, I think, lines up so well with experimenting with wind and water in Maine and ice and thawing and um, what have you. I've seen some really wonderful activities around that. Okay, let me back up for just a second. So you may have noticed that many of the components are happening in a whole group manner. Um, some of them are happening in a small group manner and centers is happening on a student's individual choice. And if you are adding up the time that we recommend for each of those components, it can be overwhelming and it can eat up your daily schedule very quickly. So we have created some sample schedules that teachers and administrators can look at and use to help guide their own planning. Understanding, of course, that every school is a little different. The time that your students arrive, the time that you have for breakfast or lunch, the time of your departure, those are all really unique to every school. So our, anything that we provide on our Pre-K for Me site is really just a sample um, and meant to be a resource, resource to help guide you. So this is an example of a half day schedule. Like I said, many of our programs still operate in a part day way. Some of them are two hours or three hours some variation of that. Um, but you'll notice that even in a half day schedule, uh, we can really fit a lot in. Um, read aloud, intro to centers, and center time, even thinking and feedback. Those are really the three, arguably the four, most important components if you're going to choose to implement pre-K for me. The other components, Swipple, small group, let's find out about it will also fit in a part day schedule, but some of them may not happen on a daily basis, depending on how your program is spread out throughout the week. So those are the things that we really like to work with teachers on and really sort of finite um, out all those details for, for your day. But read aloud centers and intro to centers um, will be happening on a daily basis. And we like to include um, breakfast and recess, of course, as well. So this looks like it's the two and a half hour sample. There is a two hour sample and there is a three hour sample. And there is a full day sample. So this is an 8.30 to two o'clock example. Again, read aloud, intro, centers, and thinking and feedback, or read the core pieces of your day. And then typically classrooms will go outside, they'll have lunch, and then the afternoon, if you're a full day program, you have to offer some type of rest. And then there we fill in the rest of the day with the other components. Swipple, let's find out about it. Um, small group, storytelling, story acting, etc. Um, so none of this is concrete or written in stone. This is really fluid. Um, there are some things that have to ha happen the way they're scheduled or the in the order in which we have them, um, but certainly a lot of flexibility and timing as well. I'm just going to pause there and leave this here for a second. Okay, so pre-K for me is is just that it's the components and, and the schedule that I just walked us through. When we have training and when we work with teachers looking to get their classrooms and their environments up, environments up and going, um, we do have really specific uh, recommendations for arguably any pre-K classroom, um, but certainly if you're planning to implement pre-K for me. So this is just a quick picture and in, in of a I actually think this might be a kindergarten classroom, um, but it does model well what we talk about in pre-K in terms of really using your furniture and your materials to delineate space, um, really utilizing the floor, utilizing the walls, utilizing shelves um, in a clean, organized, and aesthetically pleasing way. Uh, we like to tell teachers that the layout of the physical environment fosters encounters, communication, learning, and relationships. So when there's too many materials or not enough materials, 
that's going to affect which students access that space and how they're um, accessing the materials. When there's um, too much space or not enough space, same thing, right? It's going to directly affect who's able to, um, to learn and play in that area. So setting up the environment is another big conversation that we, uh, that we have during training and throughout the school year so that it's set up in a way that helps promote the learning and helps promote positive behaviors and helps promote positive interactions of everybody that's in the space. So these were just some other quick uh, photos of some pre-K classrooms, and their writing centers and citing, um, science centers and part of their block area. Um, this is a quick photo of a dramatic play center. There's a space, it, it's currently in this picture set up as a home or as a kitchen. Throughout the units, the dramatic play center does sort of change and morph into other things like a grocery store, it changes into a flower shop, um, it could change into a post office. So it's not always a kitchen. Um, and another unit, it's set up as a laundromat. So lots of uh, flexibility here. There are some classrooms that teachers will say, you know, I have a group of students that love it set up as a kitchen. And if I take it away and change it into something else, then it causes a storm. Well, okay, let's think about ways that we could keep it as a kitchen, but also incorporate a flower shop or also incorporate a grocery store. Um, because like I said, it's very intentionally planned. Um, it, it, the learning and the content that we want happening in these areas um, is very strategic. So just keeping it a kitchen and not offering it as another space during a unit um, could not could cause the wrong conversations or, or not encourage the right interactions to be happening. We want classrooms to be well organized. And by that, it will help children to utilize the space efficiently. It will allow the teachers more time to be with children to see and hear them from across the room to allow children to be more self-directed, more self-reliant and interdependent. Um, an organized classroom helps encourage longer attention spans, which you'll see it get longer and longer as the school year progresses. They're well-designed and purposefully and intentionally designed. And I thought I had one more bullet there, but I didn't. So our plan for training this summer will be sometime during the week of July 31st through August 4th. And I say sometime um, because we have pre-K for me, K for me, and first grade for me happening during this time. And we wanna make sure that we're using folks on our team's capacity, as well as those of you in the field that may need to attend more than one. I'm thinking administrators, maybe ed techs um, that need to attend more than one training perhaps. So we wanna make sure that we're offering it sometime during that week, it will occur over two consecutive days. The location is still to be determined, but we do plan for it to be in person. Last summer we had it in person, it went really well. Um, but we wanna make sure our space this year is more accommodating. Um, Pre-K for me continues to grow, which is in incredible and very exciting, um, but knowing as early as possible how many people plan to be there will really help us determine where to offer the training. So if we're, we are asking now that if folks are interested in signing up for the summer Pre-K for me training, that they do so through this link here. I can throw it in the chat in just a moment. Um, in the meantime, we do have recordings available on our Pre-K for Me site. Um, and then next year, as we've done the past two years, we plan to offer ongoing support and professional learning communities for anyone interested. Um, so that typically happens once a month and each month it's for one hour virtually and we focus on a certain component of the program uh, with teachers that are uh, some are veteran and some are um, rookie in terms of the pre-k for me curriculum and I do have a video let me just I had just had to stop sharing for a moment because I don't think I shared my sound So 
So as you sort of process what I said, if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat. And while you do that, I'm going to just share this video of a pre-K for me classroom in Southern Maine. Research is when you want to learn more about something. How could he clean his shirt? Wash it in the washer. Yeah, he could wash it in the washer. Oh, yeah, and give it a bath. Maybe he could put it in a big tub of soapy water. You can, you can scrub it with soap. Sure, you could scrub it with some soap. Maybe if it's just a little spot. Is this just a little spot? No, it's no. ginormous. Look at it. He's all covered. I would wash. My mom will wash my clothes every day. How does she do that? Um, the washing machine is right next to the bathroom. So it's in your house. Does anybody not have a washing machine in their house? I have a washer and a dryer. All right. My washer and dryer is connected. Okay. I don't have one eye. How do you wash your clothes? There is on top of my do a different washer down the street. I do on the back. You might go to a laundromat, which is a place you can go that is filled with washers and dryers, and you can wash your clothes and then bring them back home. You notice there were buttons and you can turn it on. What shape were the buttons? Circles. Circles. And then there's little oh. lines on top. Okay, so there were lines on top? Um, there are squares. What were squares? Um, the <coughs> things you can open up. pictures of on here so you know it's a washer. You can wipe this thing. Oh that's a good idea. I could label it. What? What, what letter should I start w. with? W. w. You could draw cool things on this right there. Oh, that's a good idea. We could draw pictures of clothing to go there. What did you notice on the buttons for the dryer? Uh, it goes in tens. <laughs> We did research and then we created it. Are you so proud of what you did? Yeah. What do you think your favorite part will be? My favorite part is the sun. It dries off all the clothes that are on the clothesline. It has a square and a circle. It has a square and a circle. Mm -hmm. And then two together, like two pieces in a puzzle. And together it fits like pieces of a puzzle? Mm -hmm. throw that link into the chat box for pre-registering for summer training in case if any folks need to access that. And then was there any questions or anything that you wanted me to clarify, discuss again, anything like that?